my kids got in the spirit of the video deal and they each did a, this is a two inversions, so here we are. But I, I got I got sidetracked, so I got to back up and cover burning with less a little bit more because I, I think that's really important for us, um, and, and I think it's the future to our fire culture. We need to be able to have fires with two or three people on a unit. Um, one way to do that is to start small with fire, and we built many a fire break at the home place with a backpack sprayer or a leaf blower uh, and a torch and using a game trail. And you know it's not rocket science, but you know, you can look at some grasses and know that that's going to burn a lot harder. It may burn over my edge. And so we may, we may step away from the trail and come back. But uh, it, you have to be able to identify the good burners in your pasture and know how much buffer, you know, whether you, that could be right on the game trail or whether it needs to be a couple feet away. Um, the cedars, agarita, persimmon, the greenbrier, uh, big bunch grasses, uh, you, you have to identify those for, for what they will do and how they behave and how much they like fire. Uh, the biggest step that we can all be doing is building good fire breaks. Um, uh, if you're going to go to the expense of a 15 to a 20 foot wide fire guard and then make a double fire guard around your unit and multiple blocks, uh, I can save you time and tell you that I would rather have one 30 foot strip around it and we'll just burn it all in one day. But if you create the bones for a good fire break that your fire program will survive beyond your efforts because it will not be, uh, it will be more fun on burn day. Um, and then we also look for people to, uh, to get the volatile brush, at least on the, the north side or the downwind side, give us another uh, 20, 25 feet where those cedars and, and trees that are going to catch on fire and blow an ember over. Uh, we'd like those laid down. We'd rather them not be piled. We'd love for them to be pushed into the unit, um, but we, we want to caution against piling those against other volatiles where you end up creating a bigger problem. Um, and, and timing of your fire is really important. Uh, the only the only actual fire that we've had spot away from us, uh, and and we don't we don't count it if it's smaller than a pie plate, even if there's seven or eight of them all at once. Uh, but uh, we were burning in Comanche. We'd set up the burn, and this is maybe two years ago. They did the fire breaks, and then they got some tropical weather, and we were on hold, and it was three months before the landowner was ready for us. And when they pushed the trees down to make the fire break, uh, we weren't afraid of it because we didn't think we'd get the leaves burned off of it because it was all going to be fresh and down and disturbed. But three months later, that stuff had dried out and it, it created a wall of fire on the back fire side and uh, uh, went across the county road and into a field of pine grass that was uh, shirt pocket high. and. Uh, we went in there with a sprayer and a leaf blower and caught it and put it out and it would end up being seven acres. Uh, that's our biggest pooch. Um, so you need to keep all those factors in mind. It's not enough to dissect it once. And like Blackbird was saying, when we're on the fire, when we're carrying torches, you're constantly fluffing, you're constantly assessing, and you're constantly communicating. Um, on the firing techniques, uh, again, there is no perfect forecast, no textbook condition. Uh, I will always encourage you to burn and not postpone your fire. Uh, that way you move the ball off the line of scrimmage. Um, think of some of your burns that, you know, it may be uh, you want a reclamation burn, but, but we need to have a, a layup shot to uh, get close enough to the green that, that it's, it still meets my goal of having a safe fire. Um, so uh, even like we were talking, alluding to earlier that you know, we may start at 85% relative humidity when we start a fire out. And, and that, we're going to wait for y'all tomorrow, but we normally start around 7, 7.30, and uh, we'll burn 1,800 acres before noon uh, and walk in eight, eight miles of fire, and it'll be a, it'll be a great fire. You, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference during the time of day, even as a scientist, with the damage the fire does. If the fuel is there, the effect of the fire is going to, going to carry through. Um, 
but you know it's such a small percent of the unit that gets underburned that it's not a uh, it's not a factor or a detriment to the quality of your fire. It's actually an advantage to your safety. Um, we run four to five torches uh, down the downwind boundary and we start to build our black. And this is what you'll see us do tomorrow. We stagger them out and Blackbird's torch one, he, he goes and he sets the pace. And when he needs fuel, everybody stops and, and they come out and pretty much have it orchestrated that way. Uh, but what we're looking for is that torch two, if torch one is right on the edge of the fire guard, torch two might be three feet in, depending on how tall the grass is, how much brush. And what we want is for torch two's flame to lay in the black. If torch two is cl too close to torch one and that fire is fire with torch one, then we just created this wall of fire that is hotter and more volatile than the, than the two separate rows of fire. And, and we do that, you know, four to five torches. We're looking to get, you know, 40 to 50 feet if we can, and we keep doubling our space. Once that first and second torch goes through, I'm ignoring the fire guard. It's just a safety measure, but I'm building off black and not using the fire guard to stop the fire. I'm using the black to stop the fire uh, from advancing. Um, after, after we built, oh, 400 yards, 500 yards of fire. I mean, in Kimball County, when we're burning in the summer and we're, we're, we're supposed to be burning out all the trees, cedars, we'll get some live oaks. We don't normally don't kill the live oak. It's one of the hardiest trees on the plateau. Uh, 500 yards, um, when it's a full head fire in the crown of the trees, uh, it sounds like a freight train coming. And uh, I've had my, my hat knocked off on the fence lines from the force of the fire and it had gone out, but that, that's something you don't want to, uh, to mess with. And you know, another reason uh, uh, we like to start early because all of it, 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 it improves our potential to recover from mistakes. Um, so we, we got the 500 yards in and then we pick up and we go down the next most volatile flank. So if it's a if it's a southeast wind, we're going to burn out the north side. We're going to build our black, and then we're going to start on the west side. And we may bring four torches down that west side. Uh, and then once we've got that set up, that's when we do our next flank, and it probably is one torch. And and then depending on how volatile the fuels are on the back on the head fire side, we may like that from a four wheeler. Uh, we may put it in, in uh, by foot by walking it in, but of course you generally only need one torch unless it's really heavy brush and we're afraid that uh, it's not penetrating. But we try and ring every unit that we burn and that's our goal. Uh, uh, one technique we use uh, on the flanks is uh, we may lay two rows of fire down close enough to each other that, we, that they will draw each other in. Uh, and that helps protect our outside if we use the second row of, because the oxygen and the, somehow the way it works, it brings two flames. Dr. Russ can tell you, I can just tell you it works. Uh, another thing we do is on a flank uh, where we just carry one torch, but we want it to be wider or, or a bigger effect every 30 feet or so. If, if we're taking it straight down here from Bravo to Charlie, we want to throw fire in 10 feet or so, about every 30, 35 feet, and it creates a block where the upwind side is the backfire, the, the black that stops the, the, the fire running, and the other side started the head fire, and so we fill in these blocks against our black, and that, that creates, uh, you know, depending on how far you can throw the fire, uh, whether two or three torches might have gone through all in one pass. Um, again, uh, uh, every day is a, is a good burn day. Uh, use your weather against building a catastrophe. Um, like I said, I use weather.gov, the tabular forecast. Um, there's boxes that have to do with fire. The, those are all important. Um, print out that forecast. 
I print, I print mine every time and I make notes, actual notes from the fire during the burn. Uh, but it's a good idea to print it because when you do go to court, every attorney there is going to have their own forecast from a different weather site. And so it helped that you have yours to say, this is what I was using. Um, wind is the number one factor that I'm afraid of on a fire. Uh, and if anybody's, has anybody seen the dust devil on a hot afternoon? Yes. And can you imagine one of those all crammed full of fire and embers and smoke and heat? Uh, well, we can, we've seen it, uh, we, but uh, nobody's ever seen them early in the morning. And again, that's why we start early in the morning to avoid that. Um, but with our firing techniques, we, we use the, the forecast and the weather to meet the goals of the burn. Uh, often it's protect the oak trees. And so we may go in where it's kind of a bubble on the humidity and that the fire will not penetrate under those trees and it just walks around. It. Other times, you know, we may want to take out all the trees. Uh, but it's, it's a decision you make based on a forecast and how you light your fire. Um, if there's any recurring theme, it needs to be communication, location, and awareness for potential wrecks. You need to see things that are going to be a problem. When I go down a fire guard, uh, an agarita or a yucca or a cedar tree, uh, it makes me nervous sometimes. And, and, and we'll even walk ahead if the fire guard hadn't been, been cleared well and cut those before we get to it as we're going. Um, we have, uh, we burned uh, 2,200 acres in one unit on the Fort Worth city limits. And the, there was a street, you may see a picture of a fire hydrant on the edge of our barn. We've never had that luxury. We didn't have a key to the fire hydrant. We bought our own water. But uh, we had the Tarrant County Fire Marshal, two news helicopters. I think half of Tarrant County was on that highway looking at us. Uh, and about every 90 minutes, the same fire station would respond, full sirens and lights and come. It got to the point where they would just shut it down and make a U-turn and go home. But for some reason, they kept coming. And, you know, so it, it, it comes back to communication and trying to understand the people you're dealing with. Uh, we have another burn upcoming that has I-35 as its north side. And uh, actually has a highway on three sides and an ammunition plant on the four side, <laughs> and we're going to aim for the ammunition plant. <laughs> so uh, pay attention to your weather, pay attention to what you're doing, you know, see the problems, identify the grass, the brush, you know, being able to identify these plants on your property is going to be key to how you interpret what fire is going to do later. Um, we're going to have a good fire tomorrow. It's going to be a smoky fire. I think there's one of the questions is asked because it's got a lot of green to it. Um, I don't know if the green is going to be uh, negative to the plants around there uh, with, with too much smoke, but uh, I think that we're going to put every plant there down on the ground. And uh, it's great with the mesquite trees to burn now with the canopy because we'll drop all those leaves off and we'll put those trees on the sideline this year too. Any questions? Yes, sir. Do you, uh, uh, I mean, you're relying on whether or not go, but you got to. One of your guys with a cash and you I do, I do, and a lot of times I put it up. I get scared when they start telling me stuff. And like I said, we started the fire, and you know, there's nothing to do but finish it at that point. Uh, uh, but yes, we take on site, kidding mostly, we take on site weather readings, and I found that, that my equipment on site is different than the, even the internet location at the closest airport. So having that information, you know, we, we, we considered it. We're not being uh, uh, negligent. We're not being grossly negligent. We have considered it all, and we're keeping track of it. And uh, but then again, I, you don't want to record stuff that may be incriminating later, um, relative humidities. And, not kidding, but it's uh, it's it's important to have this and be able to take it on site. Yes, sir. I know we're talking about prescribed burns, but would you mind talking about the technique of fighting fire with fire in a wildfire situation? Sure, we, we build it backwards. It's like, you know, your friends are playing a joke on you and they lit the head fire and now you gotta stop it. Uh, what we do, and, and the, the satellite pictures on our phones, 
has improved this ability quite a bit. But uh, a lot of things that Blackbird and I would do maybe is, is if, and, and you cannot, a few years ago, before 2011, we could talk to the Forest Service and we could tell them to hold up. We could tell them not to deploy. We could tell them to wait to the next place. They've had legislation passed where if you try and tell them that, they can knock you on the head and put you in the trunk and drive around with you for a week and forget about you. But, uh, and to no harm for them. But uh, we're looking for openings. We're looking for, we're looking to take this oil field road and tie it in to this ranch road or something where it takes, uh, we've got the equipment and we can put, push a bladed line or even, or even bring in a lot of fire trucks to come behind us and, and mop that up as we go. Uh, we'll build a wet line at the same time and put water, put water down, put fire next to the water, and then be ready if it crosses that water to put it out. But all I need, if I get this much black to start, I can build black against it and we can stop the fire. So what we do is we, we build where we're, the fire is going with ample time to get it done. And uh, uh, there was a, when all those big fires broke out, there was one was called the Encino Fire, and it was 18,000 acres. And uh, we stopped it on Arden Road with uh, maybe four miles of fire. And I had some pictures, they're not in here, of my fire, backfire, meeting that ginormous head fire. And it went out. And that's an interesting picture. But the really cool picture would have been if I had taken a picture on Arden Road of 150 fire trucks watching two guys put out the whole fire. Uh, so what you're looking to do is you turn your map. You know, it's like if you get, when you ring, do rings for fire, ring a unit, if the wind changes, and this is my map orientation, and the wind just shifted. Now I turn my map, and I'm oriented for the wind again, and I'm still doing the same program. I still got legs to put in, uh, but, but that's what you're trying to do, is you're gonna steal, steal the fuel so the fire doesn't go anywhere else by building a fire that you can control. Great questions. Oh, okay. Sorry. Time for one more. Sorry. We just had a wildfire about uh, a week ago, and the rain ended up putting out. But hindsight, looking at it, we could have had a back fire burn into it and stopped it on our own. But it started on the neighbors, and I'm sure they didn't want the fire at all. And it got on to us, and it, we really wanted to burn when it burned on us. <laughs> and, but I'm, my point is, if it hadn't rained out, would it? How would you explain to them that we're going to allow y'all to have to the property to burn and just, you know, we're not run out there with fire trucks and not, wouldn't be doing this good? I, I, I don't know that. I don't think you can if they called 911 already. I mean, I just, I, I don't, and Mr. Price may be to say different, I don't, I don't think we have that say anymore, even on private land. Uh, but what you can do is minimize the damage that they're going to cause with their equipment. And, and, and suggest to them better locations. You know, up against an oil field road or a road or a fence line or something that, that is, is already cleared of brush. Uh, you know, uh, Goodyear is one of our clients here in San Antonio County and the Forest Service uh, in the Wildcat Fire denied them assistance because they never spent any money on brush control and that they could afford it. And so they were scared, and we helped uh, develop a fire, wildfire contingency plan. And you might have seen it, it's off 277, but we had them clear two 500 foot strips uh, one 277, one Orient Road. And the first fire we did there was a thousand brush piles. And then this year, we just set the strip off and, and showed them, but it had a fire guard on either side, and they have enough, they have their own fire department there basically. And, and went through the steps for when it's, oh heck, we come and we light this, and that, that holds the fire off. Uh, if, if you, no matter if you get them to put the, put the fire out where you want them to, or where they want to, the next decision then would be finishing that job. And if you wanted the rest of your pasture burn, you know, it would be ideal to be able to burn into it. And that's, that's one of the things about burning with less. If, if we look at, at having black and then 
dividing our units up that we're burning into something we've already burned, we may only need a big crew for our very first fire. And depending on what direction that fire came into you from, you may be able to burn the rest of the pasture back into that black and have very little, very little cost of preparing for the prescribed fire you want to have. But if you're going to have to rest the pasture anyway or do something for recovery, uh, it would be a, a behoove you to, to clean it up and, and get it all on the same, the same page for, for recovery. 